Chapter Five of Alcatraz by Max Brand. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Retribution. Coles had advertised the auction sale of the mares to take place immediately after the race, and though he gladly would have postponed it, he had to live up to his advertisement. Naturally, the result was disastrous. The ranchers had seen the ragged Alcatraz win against the imported horses, and they felt they could only show their local patriotism by failing to bid. There were one or two mocking offers of a hundred dollars a head for the lot, something pretty for my girl to ride, as one of the ranchers phrased it, laughing. The result was that every one of the mares was knocked down to Mary Ann at a ludicrously low price, so low that when it was over and Coles strolled about with her to indicate the size of her bargain, she felt that she was moving in a dream. "'It's easy to see that you're not Western,' he said in the end. "'But you have a Western horse to thank for putting this deal through. I mean Alcatraz.' "'He's too ugly for that,' said Marianne, and yet on her way back to the hotel she realized that the sun-faded chestnut had truly proved a gold mine to her. It had been, she felt, the luckiest day of her business life, for she knew that the price she had paid for the mares was less than half a reasonable valuation of them. Here was her ranch, ready stocked, so to speak, with fine horses. It only needed now to end the tyrannical sway of Lou Hervey, and in that fighting man of men, Red Paris, Marianne felt that the solution lay. Once in her hotel room, she looked about her in some dismay. Of course, she was merely an employer, receiving a prospective employee to examine his qualifications, but she also remained, in spite of herself, a girl receiving a man. She was glad that no one was there to watch with quizzical eye as she rearranged the furniture. She was doubly glad that he could not watch her at the mirror. She gave herself the most critical examination since she left the East, and on the whole, she approved of the changes. The stirring life in the open had darkened the olive of her skin, she found, but also had made it more translucent. The curve of her cheek was pleasantly filled, her throat rounder, and her head better poised. And above all, excitement gave her the vital color. She paused at this point to wonder why a stray cowpuncher should make her flush, but immediately decided that he had nothing to do with it. It was the purchase of the mares that kept alive the little thrill of happiness. But Marianne was essentially honest, and when her heart jumped as she heard a swift, light step come down the hall and pause at her door, she admitted at once that horses had nothing to do with the matter. She wished ardently that she had made the discovery sooner. As it was, before she composed herself, he had knocked, been bidden in, and stood before her. She knew, inwardly dismayed, that her eyes were wide, her color high, and her whole expression one of childish expectancy. It comforted her greatly to find that he was hardly more at ease than she. He made futile efforts to rub some dust from his shirt. "'I wanted to get fixed up,' he said, "'but the note said to come right after the race, Miss Jordan.' In fact, he made a harem scarum figure. The fight with him of the mustaches had produced rents invisible at a distance, but distinct at close hand, and the dust and the sweat had faded the blue of his shirt and the red of his bandana. But the red flame of that hair and the keen blue of that eye, they, to be sure, were not faded. She discovered other things as he crossed the room to her that he was far shorter than he had seemed when he fought in the street. Indeed, he was middle height and slenderly made at that. She felt that looking at him from her window and watching him ride rickety, she had only seen the spirit of the man and not the physical fact at all. He shook hands. She was glad to see 
that he neither peered at her slyly, as a vain man is apt to do when he meets a girl who has sought him out, nor met her sullenly, as is the habit of the bashful Westerner. His head was high, his glance straight, and his smile appreciated her with frank enjoyment. She tried to match her speech with his outright demeanor. I have a business offer to make. I won't take a great deal of your time. Ten minutes will do. Won't you sit down, Mr. Paris? She took his tattered hat and pointed out a seat to him, noting, as she herself sat down, that he was as erect in his chair as he had been standing. There was something so adventurously restless about Red Paris that she thought of a thoroughbred fresh from the stable, just as a blooded hunter is apt to be too much horse under the saddle, so she was inclined to feel that Paris was too much man. Something about him was always moving. Either his lean fingers fretted on the arm of the chair, or his foot stirred, or his glance flickered, or his head turned proudly. Going back to the thoroughbred comparison, she decided that Paris badly needed to have a race or two under his belt before he would be worked down to normal. She noted another thing. At close hand, he was more handsome. In the meantime, she had to talk. It would be pleasanter to find some indirect approach. One was offered by the fob, which hung outside the watch pocket of his trousers. It was a tarnished, misshapen lump of metal. I can't help asking about that fob, she said. I've never seen one even remotely like it. He fingered it with a singular smile. Tell you about it, he said amiably enough. I was standing by, looking at a large-sized fracas one day, and me doing nothing, just as peaceful as an old plow horse, when a gent steps up and drills me in the leg. His bullet had to cut through my holster, and it jammed into my thigh bone. Put me in bed for a couple of months, and when I got out, I had the slug fixed up for a fob, just so's I'd remember the man that shot me. That's about five years back. I ain't found him yet, but I'm still remembering, you see. He finished the anecdote with a chuckle, which died out as he saw her eyes widen with horror. Five years ago, she was thinking, he must have been hardly more than a boy. How many other chapters as violent as this were in his story? And he didn't even offer to pay the doctor bill, I'll wager. Him? Paris chuckled. He'll pay it some day. It's just postponed. Slow collection, that's all. He shrugged the thought of it away and straightened a little, plainly waiting to hear her business. But her mind was still only half on her own affairs as she began talking. I have to go into the affairs of our ranch a little, she said, so that you can understand why I've asked you to come here. My father was hurt by a fall from a horse several years ago, and the accident made him an invalid. He can't sit a saddle, and because of that he has lost all touch with his business. Worst of all, he doesn't seem to care. The result was that everything went into the hands of the foreman, but the foreman was not very successful. As a matter of fact, the ranch became a losing investment, and I came out to try to run it. I suppose that sounds foolish. She looked sharply at him, but to her delight, for the first time his eyes had lighted with a real enthusiasm. Sounds pretty fine to me, said Red Paris. The foreman doesn't think so, she answered. He wants his old authority. So he makes your trail all uphill. By simply refusing to advise me. My father won't talk business. Lou Hervey won't. I'm trying to run a dollar business with a cent's worth of knowledge and no experience. I can't discharge Hervey. His service has been too long and faithful. But I want to have someone up there who will go into training to take Hervey's place eventually someone who knows cattle and can tell me what to do now and then. Mr. Paris, do you know the cow business? Some of his interest faded. Most folks raised in these parts do, he answered obliquely. I should think you could get a dozen anywhere. 
she explained eagerly, it's not so simple. You see, Lou Hervey is rather a rough character. In the old days, I think he was quite a fighter. I guess he still is. And he's gathered a lot of fighting men for cowpunchers on the ranch. When he sees me bring in an understudy for his part, so to speak, I'm afraid he might make trouble, unless he was convinced it would be safer to keep his hands off the new man. The gloom of Paris returned. He was still politely attentive, but his head turned, and his eager eyes found something of interest across the street. She knew her grip on him was failing, and she struggled to regain it. Here was her man, she knew. Here was one who would ride the fiercest outlaw horse on the ranch, wear out the toughest cowboy, play with them to weariness when they wanted to play, fight with them to exhaustion when they wanted to fight, and, as her right-hand man, advise her for the best. As for terms, the right man can make them for himself, she concluded, hopelessly. Mr. Paris, I think you could be the man for the place. What do you say to trying? He paused diffidently, and she knew that in the pause he was hunting for polite terms of refusal. I'll tell you how it is. You're mighty kind to make the offer. You haven't seen much of me, and the little bit has been pretty rough. He laughed away his embarrassment. So I appreciate your confidence a lot, but I'm afraid I'd be a tolerable lot like Hervey. He hurried on, lest she should take offense. You see, I don't like orders. Of course, if it were a man who made the offer to you, she began angrily. He raised his hand. There were little touches of formal courtesy in him, so contrasted with what she had seen of him in action. So, at variance with the childish, gaudy clothes he wore, that it put Marianne completely at sea. It's just that I like my own way. I've been a rolling stone all my life. About the only moss I've gathered is what you see. He touched the dust-tarnished gold braid on his sombrero, and his twinkling eyes invited her to mirth. But Marianne was sternly silent. She knew that her color was gone and that her beauty had in large part gone with it, a reflection that did not at all help her mood or her looks. I get my fun out of playing a free hand, he was concluding. I don't like partners. Not that I'm proud of it, but so you can see where I stand. If I don't like a bunkie, you can figure why I don't want a boss. She nodded stiffly, and at the unamiable gesture she saw him shrug his shoulders very slightly. His eyes wandered again, as though he were seeking for a means to end the interview. Marianne rose. "'I see your viewpoint, Mr. Paris,' she said coldly, "'and I'm sorry you can't accept my offer.' He came to his feet at the same moment, but he lingered a moment, turning his hat thoughtfully so that she hoped for an instant that he was on the verge of reconsidering. After all, she should have used more persuasion. She was firmly convinced that at heart men are very close to children. Then his head went up, and he shook away the mood which had come over him. Sometime I'll come to it, he admitted, but not yet a while. I take it mighty kind of you to have thought that I could fill the bill, and I'm wishing you all sorts of luck, Miss Jordan. Thank you, said Marianne, and hated herself for her unbending stiffness. At the door he turned again. I sure hope it's easy for you to forget songs, he said. Songs? echoed Marianne, and then turned crimson with the memory. You see, explained Red Jim Paris, it's a bad habit I've picked up of doing the first fool thing that comes into my head. Goodbye, Miss Jordan. He was gone. She felt, confusedly, that there were many things. She should have said, and at the same time, there was a strange surety that sometimes she would see him again and say them. She walked absently to the window, which opened on the vacant lot to the rear of the hotel. Red Paris vanished from her mind, for below she saw Cordova in the act of tethering Alcatraz to the rack 
which stood in the middle of the lot. Saddle and bridle had been removed. The stallion wore only a stout halter. The Mexican kept on the far side of the rack and whipped his knot together hastily. It was not till he sprang back from his work that she saw the snaky length of an eight-foot black snake uncoil from his hand. He passed the lash slowly through his fingers while surveying the stallion with great complacence. The ears of Alcatraz flattened back, a sufficient proof that he knew what was coming. He maintained his weary attitude, but it now seemed one of despair. As for Marianne, she refused to admit the ugly suspicion which began to occur to her. But Cordova left her only a moment for doubt. The black streak curled around his head, and through the open window she heard the crack of the lash end. Alcatraz did not stir under the blow. Once more, the black snake whirled, and Cordova leaned back to give the stroke the full stretch of arm and body. Yet Alcatraz did not so much as lift an ear. Only when the lash hung in mid-air did he stir. The rope which tethered him hung slack, and this enabled the stallion to give impetus to his backward leap. All the weight of his body, all the strain of his leg muscles snapped the rope taut. It vibrated to invisibility for an instant, then parted with a sound as loud as the fall of the whip. The straining body of Alcatraz, so released, toppled sideways. He rolled like a dog in the dust, and when, with the agility of a dog, he gained his feet, Cordova was fleeing toward the hotel with a horror-stricken face. Even then, she could not understand his terror, not until she saw that Alcatraz had wheeled and was bolting in hot pursuit. He came like the devil horse that the Mexican called him, with his ears flattened and his mouth gapping. He came with such velocity that Cordova, running as only consummate terror can make a man run, seemed to be racing on a treadmill, literally standing still. The picket fence, which set off the backyard of the hotel, gave the man an instant of delay, a terribly vital instant, indeed, that seemed to Mary Ann to contain long, long minutes. But here he was over and running again. In her dread she wondered why he was not shrieking for aid. But the face of Cordova was rigid, a nightmare mask. Twenty steps now to the hotel, and surely there was still hope. No, for Alcatraz sailed across the pickets with a bound that cut in two the distance still dividing him from his master. It all happened, perhaps, within the space of three breaths. Now Marianne leaned out of the window and screamed her warning, for the faded chestnut was on the very heels of the Mexican. He raised his contorted face at her cry, then threw up both his arms to her in a gesture she could never forget. Shoot, yelled Cordova. Amigo, amigo, shoot, quick. Then Alcatraz struck him. Half the bones in his body must have been broken by the impact. It spun him over and over in the dust. Yet as the impetus of the chestnut carried him far past, Cordova struggled to his feet and attempted to flee again. Alas, it was only a step. His left leg crumpled under him. He toppled sideways, still wriggling and twisting onward through the dirt, and then Alcatraz struck him again. This time it was no blind rush. Back and forth, up and down, he crossed and recrossed, wheeled and reared and stamped, until his one white stocking was crimsoned and the spurts of red flew out and turned black in the dust. The horror which had choked her relaxed, and Marianne shrieked again. It was the second cry which saved the faint spark of life for Cordova. For, at that sound, the stallion leaped sideways from the body of his victim, lifted his head towards the half-fainting girl in the window, and trumpeted a great neigh of defiance. Still neighing, he swerved away in a gallop, cleared the fence a second time, and fled from view. End of chapter 5